In my younger and more vulnerable years, I read a piece of advice that said, don't worry about labeling yourself, enough people will do that for you. So, I won't necessarily label myself right now, but um, I want to give you some descriptions of who I am that might help you understand where I'm coming from in this reflection. I teach art and English and women's studies. I turned 38 this month. I volunteer in this spiritual community by supporting anti-racist work. I don't eat meat. I am the sponsor of four clubs at the high school where I teach. The GSA, commonly known as the Gay Straight Alliance, Students Against Sexual and Gendered Violence, a slam poetry group, and the Community of Racial Equity for Advancement. A label I am proud to claim is feminist. I have three NPR stations on my radio presets in my Subaru that has an IPR bumper sticker. So are you getting the picture? <laughs> Found a place for me on the political spectrum. <laughs> but there are two spots in my life where I'm pretty conservative, coffee and grammar. Can you imagine a more obnoxious snob, <laughs> coffee and grammar snob? So when one of my students enrolled in two of my classes and a member of two of the clubs that I sponsor let me know over the summer that they would rather not be referred to with gendered pronouns, he or she, it took me a second to remember what I knew about gender neutral pronouns, z, zim, and zur, and then I was fine with it. I added the gender neutral pronouns to all of my PowerPoints, explained to my students why I was using them, and thought all was good. And then, after one of our GSA meetings, the student said that they would rather be referred to using the pronoun they. This one singular student wanted to be referred to using a plural pronoun. It's like I could hear the record scratch. And you know, like every paper that I've ever graded where I've checked them from going using they and he, she together, running through my brain. I knew what I was doing. And I remember actually somewhere in that conversation that I handed them the bat Bedford. <laughs> That's our grammar Bible. I handed it to them and saying, if you can change this, I'm totally on board. So you know those moments when you've done something that's not quite right? Even though your brain is telling you which section and page the rule is on, Somewhere between your heart and your stomach is telling you it doesn't matter. It's not quite right. So it takes me a long time not to listen to my head. And I reflect with my friends an awfully lot. I asked a friend of mine who's an English professor at Iowa as we waited in line for a book signing if I was on the right side in this. And she nodded in assent and commiserated in my struggle with millennials. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned that I turned 38, right? But this was like the first time that I felt old, like one of those Scooby-Doo villains. Oh, those pesky kids and their grammar. <laughs> well, after the commiserating, I must have realized that that wasn't the answer that I was really looking for. And I asked my friend, a professor at Simpson. Her response essentially was, if someone knows who they are, who are you not to respect them? And that was the answer that my heart was trying to tell me, and now my head could hear it. And it connected with what happened with me last week at a wonderful book club with an amazing group of community activists discussing the new Jim Crow. And I realized something about the violence, either verbal or physical, that I see in the world today, that it starts with a sense of fear or deep discomfort. A kind of discomfort that challenges something we hold dearly and close to our identity. I am an English teacher of grammar. Individuals are represented by singular pronouns. And my student is a they. I have to be okay with any discomfort. Because who am I not to respect someone who knows who they are? Perhaps my most important lesson throughout this experience is the understanding 
the excruciating understanding of why people who I so adamantly, vehemently disagree with might have ever said things that I would consider horrible, like marriage is only between a man and a woman, or segregation is part of the natural order, or women aren't med meant to lead. These folks, coming from a position so radically different than my own, were probably acting from deep discomfort that they felt threatened their identity. It's a painful and important compassion for me to remember. I'm going to end with a question that I picked up in my grad school years and often turn over in my mind as I work. Teachers can either be liberators or oppressors. What will you be today? I have to be able to sit with the discomfort in order to reach the truth that is trying to reveal itself. I am ever grateful to the friends, students, and lessons that continue to try to teach me to act with integrity.